and to be sharing with you our uh, May and June promotions, as well as focusing on updos and uh, really some great opportunities and some great information that will help you um, have the very, very best updo services uh, possible in your salon. Um, as I said in an introduction, this is a beautiful business network webinar that's held monthly, and we're excited to have you here. Our theme for May and June is really an important step towards the summer. That's the place where it really does uh, start to prepare us. And that is, after all the craziness of winter, we believe that the spring should be easy. We should be able to easily take care of the needs of our guests and have some simple techniques and some simple solutions for them. So promotionally, we've, decided, we've divided our promotions into easy, easy uh, types of promotions. The first easy promotion is a buy one, get one free promotion on easy styling products for the client to use. Detangle spray is a great summer product because it protects the hair from the dryness and the wind and the, some of the damage of swimming and being outside. Curl and Erupted Protein Spray is excellent for the summer because it adds strength that's needed and helps to smooth the hair. Saturation Leave-In Conditioner is a great summer product because it's easy to use. It's light enough that it can actually be your styling product for the summer season. And when you mix it with Hold On, it gives you a variety of different styling options. If you're traveling as a family or you're sending your clients out as families, it might be possible for them to just take a bottle of saturation and a bottle of Hold On and be able to create a customized styling product for mom, for dad, and for each of the kids by mixing different ratios of hold on and saturation together. And then finally, for summer back to the beach is the great reminder. It helps us create that beachy, tousled, wild texture that everyone loves in the summer. And remember, all five of these products are available to you at buy one, get one free, so that you can make them available in the salon at 50% off. Or you can also do a buy one, get one free promotion with your clients, offering them buy one and get one of lesser value for free. The next Bricado Easy promotion is Swim Easy. During the summer, it's really important that we take careful, hair, careful care of our hair, and especially if you're swimming in chlorinated pools or in the ocean, deep cleansing is often necessary, and Peppermint Scrub fills that bill perfectly. Peppermint Scrub has been paired with Detangle Spray. Detangle Spray is the perfect follow-up to Peppermint Scrub, um, being used either before swimming or after swimming. If you use detangle spray before swimming, you can spray it in the hair and it'll help prevent your hair from absorbing minerals and uh, toxins from the water in a pool, um, be, being something that can help you avoid that swimming pool green shade that we love so much. Also, detangle spray is a great thing to just have in your swim bag as you're sitting outside on the beach. Continue to spray detangle spray into the hair and separate the hair and pull it out. And, uh, and detangle the hair as the day goes by. You could also even use it as a lightweight moisturizer on your skin. Then when the day is over, you want to remove everything that's been in the hair and all of the beachy, the beachy smells and the beachy experience. And the beachy smells and beachy experience gets removed by, uh, by, by using peppermint scrub as a deep cleansing shampoo. The next, the next product or the next easy easy system is called Travel Easy. Travel Easy is designed for people to take with them um, on their trips or on their holiday. And Travel Easy contains two, um, th two ounce bottles of Cloud9 shampoo and Cloud9 treatment. It contains Back to the Beach. It also contains Actives and Maxhold Hairspray, a collection of products that will retail for $39.90 in the salon. Your salon price is $29.00 and it gives you a quick getaway travel kit that can be offered to your clients or in a, in a little signature mini tote, and the guests save 31% on that purchase. The last promotion really sets us up for our topic for today. Our topic for today, as you know, is updos. We created the Updo Easy promotion to help you identify updos, the tools that you need for updos in the salon. In the Updo Easy promotion is PowerFix Firm Holding Hairspray, which is a great finishing spray as an alternative to Max Hold Spray. Now, Max and Hold Hairspray is our number one help selling hairspray, and everybody loves it. But it's interesting how many people respond and ask us occasionally for something that is possibly more environmentally friendly. They have clients that are not interested in using aerosols, or they want to use something that can be refilled. And so PowerFix is one of our signature products. It's one of the original five products that we've created. And it's a signature product that continues to perform very, very well in an updo environment, giving you firm hold in all different levels of humidity and all kinds of weather. 
And of course, we know that shimmer sprays are a great way to finish updo styles. They're also a great tool for the summer because you can take the most simple hairdo, the most simple style, and put a little bit of shimmer spray in, and all of a sudden it works for evening, it works for glamour, or it works for something that is um, you're able to pick up and able to run with. So that's that gives you um, something to really make a difference. And then in this kit, for $15.50, we also include our updo tips. And the updo tips are things that I'm going to talk about um, today with you. And I'm going to also walk through each of the techniques that are included in the updo tips. And then you'll be able to uh, go back to your salon and recreate the things that we talk about. So this will give you a setup that you can use for creating updos within your salon or easy updos. So let's talk about updos made easy and the topic for today's discussion. One of the things that we want to uh, help, help everybody understand is that doing an updo style in the salon is no, no different than any other styling service or no different than any other technique you use in the salon. It's very, very important, however, that the entire staff be prepared and the entire staff be aware of what needs to happen in order for an updo to take place. So that's why we want to start out by talking a little bit about preparation. If you're going to offer updos in your salon, and the updos that we're focusing on today are very quick and easy. They're designed um, for summer hair to get the summer hair up, and certainly they can be, they can be um, enhanced and used for weddings or for proms or for photographs and elsewhere. But it's important to determine the style and the shape of your design before you even shampoo the hair. Talk to the guest about where they would like to see fullness, where they would like to see the hair to be flat, where they would, might like to see interest, and what they have in mind. It's really important that you have an idea of what they have in mind because once you start down the path, it sometimes becomes difficult for you to take a step backwards and say, oh, you didn't want your hair to be twisted up in the back. You wanted to leave it long at the nape. Boy, if I didn't know that going into it and I've already combed and back combed and set the hair to go up and back, it becomes more difficult to work with. So make sure you understand those parameters with a great consultation. The second thing to prepare is to cleanse and condition the hair with the correct ricotta regimen. Select Cloud9 or, or Vibracolor or our new Pure Indulgence, Curl Interrupted or Curl Karma, swell volume based upon the needs of that guest. You want to thoroughly cleanse their hair and condition their hair well before you start on the process. Now, when we're going to do a style that needs to hold and needs to last, you need to be a, a little bit careful and cautious in how you approach the styling products you select. For styling updos and for setting hair, we're looking for products that provide grip and texture to the hair rather than products that provide slip to the hair. Products like uh, Curl Interrupted Balm and Actives and Shine Drops and Gloss Pomade all provide slip and slide to the hair, but if I use those types of products in preparing the hair for an updo, I don't have anything to hold the pins in, I don't have anything that will create the volume, I'll have difficulty getting the hair to go up. And while we're kind of here talking about, about styling the hair in a, in a more dramatic way, it's really important to remember that most of our guests today have heavy long hair, and most of their hair is extremely healthy. So because their hair is healthy and they have heavier hair, it's important that we are going back and using products to create that grip. Um, in the olden days, we used to talk about getting the hair dirty with hairspray before you styled the hair, and that's what it is. You use products to get a little bit of, of working grip in the hair. The next thing is we have products that are working products versus finishing products. A working product is something that you can spray in the hair, reply to the hair, and continue to mold and continue to sculpt and continue to work on the, on the style. A finishing product is kind of a, oh, we're done now, finish. And so we use finishing products. Example of finishing products are Maxfield hairspray or, or Glow Glisten or Shimmer Spray or Actives. Those things all come in the last step. While I'm working and building the style, I want to work with products like Freefix or Movable Hold Hairspray that will help me push the style into place and create that style. In preparing for any updo, we start an updo with a set. And the set is the foundation of what's going to hold the style into place. Um, a set can be done one of three ways. A wet set is very traditional. Um, it used to be that we set hair all the time on you know, wet with gel and rollers. 
or with pin curls. And you still can do that in creating updos and, and creating modern looks. A dry set is a little bit different. A dry set, you use the same technique as you would use for a wet set, only you don't, you, you dry the hair first. And so you dry the hair with product in the hair, for example, you put hold on in the hair and then dry the hair and then you work through and set the hair, spraying the hair as you set it with Freefix or with VersaFix spray gel to hold the hair in place. Then after you dry set the hair, you apply heat. So similar to a wet set, they might sit for a few minutes under the dryer or under lamps, but the heat is going to set the hair with the use of products on hair that's already dry. And then the last type of set that we'll talk about is a curling iron or a heat set. And a curling iron set is also done on dry hair. When you do a curling iron set, one of the things that helps us when we're working towards updos is we'll use uh, little clippies or pins. And as you curl each as you place each curl, pin the curl up, or even roll the curl on a curler and the, on, on a curling iron, and then set it up on a roller to hold it in place while it cools. Clips can be very helpful in helping you to do that. And we're going to introduce a specific set to you called Ribbons and Waves, and you'll see how that set works. And it's a curling iron set that can also be done with a wet set technique or with a dry set technique, and we'll talk about how to do that. The next part of preparing successfully for a, an updo is to understand the principles of design. There are a number of different principles of design that we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. And as we walk through the design, the principles, I want you to think about how you use them in hair cutting, in hair color, and in any other part of what we're doing in the salon. The points that I'm going to be making are primarily driven by what we're doing in a styling format. Um, and today, of course, we're talking about upstyling and updos and, and a little more fancy styling. The first principle of design is movement. And movement is what causes your eye to move through the style. It creates a path for the viewer's eye to follow. Sometimes movement can be interpreted as a wave or as a curl. Maybe movement is just a line that sweeps up or a line that sweeps back. It catches your eye and moves your eye through the style. Other elements are the, the other elements guide the eye and follow the movement. The goal is to create flow that moves smoothly. As you glance at the style, where does your eye go? And then where does your eye go? And then where does your eye go? As a stylist, you get to select the path. Do I want to focus on the bangs and have them move down to the side and the lower left shoulder? Or do I want to focus on the bangs and then go up towards the back as I follow that focal path? The path leads to some sort of a focal point something that's more exciting than the areas surrounding it. So when you're creating movement in the hair, the hair can flow up, it can flow back, it can flow to the side, or it can flow down. Um, obviously down is easy because gravity takes you there. If the hair is going to flow up or back or to the side, you have to place it, you have to put it there, and you have to help it stay where it's supposed to be to point and move towards the next area or the next part of design. Another principle of design is unity. Unity is about the wholeness that is created by your style. Um, one of the biggest things that you'll notice when you talk about when we talk about unity is you'll be able to see that the design is connected and that things are consistent. The techniques that were used seem to go together, and the combination that was selected of, of curl or wave or smooth or even the combination of color together combines and makes it look like it's complete. Unity is what contributes to having a finished design. And we're going to talk about instinctive design at the end of this so you'll understand how they come together. But unity is what makes it look like it's completed and makes it look like it's finished. The next principle is harmony. Now, harmony is used when you have similar techniques or similar elements that work together. Harmony appears very uncomplicated. It appears very simple. Um, harmony is usually visually satisfying. It's it's very calming and very smooth. It's not it's not exciting. It looks like it goes together. It's kind of easy to look at when you watch it. What harmony does is it connects, helps you connect the external elements with the design. So you can connect with things like the lines of the clothing or the neckline of a dress, the print in a fabric, or the texture of the fabric that is used for the client to wear. Remember, we're just working from the neck up but usually they wear clothing and other things when they leave the salon. Um, Harmony also connects the jewelry into the hair design. It also might connect with the makeup design. So the entire look looks, looks unified. It looks like it goes together. 
It looks like it belongs. Um, one of the best examples of harmony is really classic um, style. Um, style in our in our architecture world that has Grecian elements. You look at dresses that have a tall columnar visual and have a Grecian kind of sleek look. A very a very sleek French twist where everything is in control, is in place, has a lot of harmony, and it is very pleasing and simple to look at. Um, it's simple to the eye. The next type of design is balance. Balance is the arrangement that you use of each element. Now, the goal in balance is to make sure that one element doesn't overpower the other elements, unless you're really intent on creating visual focus in one area of your design. There are three different kinds of balance. Symmetrical balance means that things are visually the same from side to side or from front to back. It, it appears to be balanced either visually or by weight. Asymmetrical balance is, a, is the opposite. It doesn't weigh or it doesn't look visually the same. The back is very heavy or the bangs are very heavy and the back is very close to the hair. Um, the vis asymmetrical balance in hair cutting is very common in side to side. We went through whole decades when it the hair was buzzed off on one side and shoulder length on the other side, and that's an example of asymmetrical balance. One of the things about working with asymmetry is to understand that we work in angles more naturally than we work in vertical lines. So if you look at something angular at a 45 degree angle, for example, it looks more balanced in an asymmetrical design rather than straight up and down part at the nose and make shave off half the head on one side and make the hair long on the other side. I'm kind of like two-faced in Batman. That's not, that's asymmetrical, but it's a difficult kind of balance. And then radial balance, I didn't get the note written in here, but radial balance is, is really the most difficult one to do because radial balance is the distance from the middle. Does it visually look like the left side is as far away from the center of the head as the right side is from the center of the head? Even though they may be different, do they have a sense of balance? Now, balance cr can create mystery. Balance is, is a little bit more than meets the eye. And so you can develop a, a look that is symmetrical or asymmetrical that still is very mysterious, that I want to see more or I want to turn and look and see if the other side works. Balance helps things look unique. Um, it looks new. It helps things look trendy. However, if the balance is not there, then it looks untidy and it looks unfinished. Um, sometimes you might have the instinct to reach up to someone's hair and push the side in or pull part of it out. That's usually an instinct to participate in the balance of that design. There's something about the balance that's not working for you or that doesn't seem to be making sense. The next design principle is emphasis. You know, emphasis is a point of attraction or dominance. Every hairstyle we create has emphasis. Are you emphasizing the back? Are you emphasizing the bang? Are you creating emphasis or lines that move your eye towards the nape of the neck? Um, what emphasis does is it helps part of the hair stand out from other shapes or from other lines. It helps a portion of the style um, be a little louder, if you will, and be a little more visible. There's three main areas that you can focus on, the top or the frontal area, the crown or above the occipital, and then the nape or below the occipital. Now, within those areas, you can be centered, centered in that area, or you can be off to one side, or you can be off to both sides. But emphasis is about drawing attention to that focal point. If you've spent all of your work creating a beautiful um, braided piece or a hair rose, and you create that emphasis, you pull the emphasis over into that area. If you remember Hunger Games, Katniss, that took over all of our salons, it was all about being off center at the nape. And that's where that braid goes. And it drew all of our eyes to that place because it was a new location. It was something a little bit different. And so everybody jumped and saw that. The next principle of design is contrast. Now, contrast is when you use elements of the design to create conflict or to conflict that when you see something smooth next to something coarse, it creates contrast. Now, you can create contrast using the texture of the hair. It can be curly or smooth. You can use complementary colors. Um, something can be, you know, warm red next to gold, or you can do cool violet next to gold or red. Um, you can also use light and dark. So when you're doing balayage techniques, you're doing highlights. Um, anytime you're doing a color technique that has darker portions and lighter portions, you're creating contrast within your design. 
Now, there are two really important parts of contrast. Dramatic contrast will cause the eye to stop and really look at it. Now, if you've created a dramatic contest, contrast, you might want to talk to, to yourself and say, okay, how do I get the eye started again? How do I get movement back in? Subtle contrast will cause the eye to pause, and then the eye will continue. Now, be sure that when you create a pause or you create a stop, that there's something to look at once I get there, not just I see the bright red against the cool ash, and I'm so intrigued by the bright red and the cool ash, I don't notice anything else. Well, I see the bright red next to the cool ash, which makes me notice the braid. That's, that's using contrast to move me to a focal point. Now, remember, once you've created contrast within the style, the movement needs to pick up, well, either one of two things. You want to be at the end of the story, or you need to start back up again somehow rather than derail it. So I've got to have my point of focus and then something else that's going to pull my eye a little bit further and cause me to dig a little bit deeper or look a little bit more. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity of doing a smoothing treatment on a woman with a lot of contrast in her hair color. And when she came in, it was curly, and you could see that there was contrast. But after the super silk treatment, it was perfectly smooth. And now, all of a sudden, I could you could see the movement and the subtlety and, and see where your eye would stop and look at violet pieces next to red pieces next to gold pieces. And it was much more dramatic after it was smooth than when it was curly and and a little more textured. So it helps you see how those work together. The next principle is proportion. Now proportion is about the, the size and the quantity of the elements that you choose. It also includes a, a connection to the total design that the person's wearing. Um, when you're working on proportion, you wanna make sure that you pay attention to the facial shape. The facial shape needs to enhance the design and vice versa. Body size is also something where proportion comes into effect. If you have someone that's extremely petite and they have gigantic hair, as long as you understand that the hair is the is the focal point and the hair the out of proportion hair is what's making a huge difference, that's okay. But you've got to understand that here's what's happening. If you've got a, someone if you've got someone that's physically large and they've got a small hairstyle, maybe you need to look at them and say, wow, we need to take their hairstyle and make their hairstyle larger and a little bit more dramatic in proportion. Fashion elements, of course, also come into play, like the neckline, the jewelry, the makeup that's appropriate to the design, so that they're making choices. And especially if you're doing hair for special occasions, we want to make choices that give you proportion and, and um, movement and unity and harmony that all goes together for the benefit of the result, rather than I dress myself, can you tell? So one of the things that, that really I look at is then as when I start judging design looking at hairstyle and fashion, um, is look at the difference between a celebrity who was dressed by a stylist for the runway and a celebrity who's in the back of People magazine where they say, you know, they're just like us and they're running through an airport or they're pouring gas or they're, you know, coming out of Starbucks. They don't get the design real, real clear when they're on their own. And I wonder if sometimes that's a handicap because someone is designing for them all the time and making them look good they don't understand how to make themselves look as good as they could. So it's a, it, it ends up being a real contrast that, you know, is really educational for us. The next one is pattern and rhythm. Now, this is the last one we're going to talk about um, breaking them down. But pattern and rhythm is created by using repetition within the design. You do this, you, you, you perfect an element, and then you do it three times or four times or five times within that style. Now, classic designs feature minimum repetition of the same design element. A lot of repetition is is interesting but be careful of too much variation if you vary the elements and you still are using a minimum number it can be very interesting but if you have too much variation it looks kind of amateurish it's kind of like the you know the kitchen sink and everything in the kitchen and here's all every every technique i know on one head too much repetition with no variation can become monotonous so there's a real balance when using repetition for pattern and rhythm um, usually if you go back to nature and you pay and you start to pay attention, everything in nature tends to occur in odd numbers. So three, five, and seven are your friends. Two, four, and six are a little bit more difficult to work with. As long as you work in odds, that's a natural pattern and a natural rhythm that you'll discover. If you haven't done it already, when you pull the the uh, the petals off of a flower for he loves me, he loves me not, or she loves me, she loves me not, um, it depends on where you start because most flowers have an odd number of petals. So you can figure out how it's going to end by knowing where to begin. 
Now, just in summary for the principles of design, before we go on to the three techniques we're going to talk about, the first thing is design will help you create and develop visual literacy. Visual literacy is the ability to look at things and say, I understand how it works. Um, in hair cutting, Sam's done a great job of creating the multiplane cutting system, and, and we teach it at the academy. We use it for color techniques as well. And what it does is it helps you break things down so you understand what makes it happen using the marker points within the, within the multiplane system. Visual literacy is very similar to verbal literacy. When we talk about literacy, we say it's studying and doing homework and reading and learning. The same thing happens in visual literacy, looking at artworks, looking at architecture, looking at nature, trains your eye so that you can see what is pleasing and see what is less pleasing. Now, most people will be able to identify whether something is beautiful, whether it's pleasing to the eye, but they may not be able to explain what makes it pleasing to the eye. Likewise, you may look at something and say, I don't like that. I'm not comfortable. It makes me squirm. That's okay. It's less pleasing but you don't necessarily know what makes it less pleasing. So here's the trick. Everyone notices whether something works or it doesn't work or it's, it looks beautiful or it's less beautiful or they're comfortable or they're uncomfortable. But the artist, and each of you are artists, the artist understands how to enhance or control the elements of design to make it work and to make it more pleasing. So what I challenge you to do is next time you see a, an item of clothing or a hairstyle or a photograph or a painting and you say, gee, I really don't like this. Get out the list of the elements of design and say, okay, I don't like it. I, I understand. I, I have visual literature that says I don't like it. But what makes me not like it? What makes you not like it is most likely one of the principles of design we've talked about. Hey, this is really pretty, but there's no harmony. It doesn't connect. Or this is really pretty, but they use contrast, and then I can't get my eyes started again because I'm looking over here in the corner. Um, those things are the things that you can determine and the things can help you learn. And remember, there's a difference between things that are objective and subjective. Objective means um, it's an external influence. Subjective means it's my opinion. Everybody, everybody is entitled to an opinion. And you can say, yes, I absolutely love this, even though the rest of the world thinks it's weird. That's okay. But realize when you're creating things on other people and sending them out into the world, they're going to be evaluated and they're going to be evaluated by people who may not be as visually literate as you and may not understand design as well as we do. They're just going to look at it and say, boy, that's beautiful. Or, wow, that, that's an odd hair color. Or those two colors together make me uncomfortable. Now, if you're trying to be edgy, uncomfortable is not a bad place to be. Art is supposed to create a reaction. But if you're trying to blend your client in and she's, you know, trying to blend in with the masses, then be careful of those things, which might make them a little uncomfortable. So here, that's, that's your design lesson for today. But I hope that helps you move forward and understand kind of how the structure of what we're going to do affects each other. So to move forward with our updos, there's some key tools that we'll work with. And I talked a little bit about these um, previously. Uh, before... before uh, we started talking about the design elements. We talked about products that grip. Setting products to create grip in the hair, examples are hold on, mousse volumizing foam, free fix light holding spray, Vibracolor Versafix spray gel, Cloud9 hot shapes, Cloud9 and finishing spray. They could be used on, on damp, wet, or dry hair and still create a hold or a texture in the hair. I need things that create grip and texture in order to successfully style um, this way. Finishing products to hold the finish style, examples would be movable maximum and power fix. I also am going to use movable and free fix as working sprays and working tools when I'm doing the style. And then for the final polish to, to, to finish off my result, glow gisson spray, shimmer sprays with gold, platinum, and pearlescent, actives infusion. Um, also, of course, we could use gloss pomade. We could use shine drops. We could use shatter. There's a whole lot of other products. Carve are all things that you could use on the final step. But as you understand, those workable products actually inhibit us. Um, to do an updo with Carve would be very difficult because Carve has weight, Carve doesn't set, and it's always flexible. But if I'm trying to pin the hair in place and put the hair where I want it to be, Carve might be my choice for detailing at the end. That's not going to be my foundation product to start to start the shape with, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Let's talk about this set. Um, Bobby, let me ask you a question. It says, is there a visual 
um, you should be seeing a PowerPoint, and there is a visual handout that you'll receive as that's in our sales technique, our sales uh, piece, our sales brochure for May June has all of the uh, design elements in it, and then the Power Fix and Shimmer Spray promotion has a, a little booklet in it that talks about the four, the three different styles that we're going to walk through. So yeah, there is something that's visual that you can you can have and that you can work with. All right, the set that we're going to do is called the Ribbons and Waves set. And the Ribbons and Waves set is created um, by making one to two inch uh, sections around the entire head. It's a checkerboard uh, pattern, as you can see on the on the head, on the, um, head uh, form next to you in the picture. Now, this can be done dry, it can be done wet, it can be done, uh, it can be done with a curling iron. So we're gonna start with a curling iron. You would curl the hair vertically, with a Marcel iron. Vertically means hold the iron up and down um, and, and curl it vertically with a full stem curl. Um, if you wet the hair, you could curl the hair and pin it into the base um, with, with um, hold on or with mousse using the, using the product. Or you could also set the hair dry in a full stem curl, um, spraying it with free fix as you made the curl and then pin it in place. Now, if you wet set or you dry set, then you need to add heat under a dryer with lamps in order to activate the styling products. Remember, full stem or off-base curls are what give you the most mobility and lift because I'm not curling all the way down to the base. I don't get volume. It's not about volume. It's about creating wave and shape within the hair strand. The other thing, if you look at the third bullet point, it says leave the last three inches out. On the photo, it shows the last three inches are just left straight. That's because we're not looking for loopy ringlets on the ends. We want something that's a little bit smoother for the three styles we're going to show you. Now, just a tip, if you change the direction of your curl on each row, it will create waves. If you go around the head clockwise and then around the head counterclockwise, going back and then around the head clockwise and around the head counterclockwise, working from the top to the bottom, if you brush that out, all of the curl will mesh together and you'll create waves. If you go the same direction on the entire head, the curl will clash and it will create volume instinctively. It will build volume into your finished style. That's a personal choice on how, you, how you're how you going to do that. Right now, because it, we're using full stem or off-base curls, there isn't lift as a result of the curl. But you can create volume within the strand if you create the curls all the same direction so they clash. Or you can create waves in something that's a little more compact if you alternate the direction. Um, remember, you're looking for a strong curl on the mid shaft, a weak base direction, and little to no curl on the ends. So in the in the model we've shown, we just left the ends out and uh, curled the base. Even if you're working with a curling iron, we would we would do the curl on a curling iron and pin the curl with a clippy just to hold it while it cools, so that we get as as strong of a curl as we can. The purpose of the curl is not to have curly hair when we're done. You'll see a photo a little bit later. But the purpose of the curl is to give structure and strength so that I can back home and build and work on the sh final shape with some foundation to start out with. Now, the first technique we use is called do it up. Now, first of all, do it up is, is we section the hair into two sections. The first section goes right, right above the, um, from the corner of the eye, right across the top of the occipital, and it's the whole top of the hair. The second section is a triangular section it goes from behind the ear to about the center of the side of the head. You can see where section number two is. Now, the third section that we're not really doing anything with is the back. The back section could be styled in ringlets or could be left long or could be, could be braided. There's a number of different things that you can do with it. But for this particular technique, we're just talking about the top and the sides of the hair. And then you're free to do whatever you want with the back section. So to start with, you back brush the back half of the section. So if you go um, right above the ear where the little point is on the back of section number two, go right to the top and go, then go in that back section. You're going to back brush that section at the base only and then gather and smooth that hair together along with the hair in the front so that it's not disturbing the curl. I still want to see all the wave in the curl and then fold the hair at the center of the crown and create a pleat. Now, creating a pleat means I'm folding the hair under so that I can see kind of a seam where that hair was and then pin that in place. We're going to talk about using pins in a second so that you understand what happens with them. 
The second thing that you do is you direct the side sections back to the first pleat. So you're directing the side sections up and back until they, in, until they interact with that top section. And then you pin that section in and then pull the other opposite side section around and pin that side section in as well. Now, this is so funny because I'm sitting in a hotel and there's a mirror right in front of me and I am doing this on my head as I talk to you about it. So it's very, very simple. Again, you're back combing half of the, back brushing half of the front section to create the volume in the back, pulling the whole front section back and pleating it down. Now, if you've got length and ends, those ends can hang out and fall into the back section that you're using. But we want to create a pleat and tuck them up under and then pull your sides back and tuck them under, the, under that pleat and pin those in place. Then take your fingers and go in and shape the front. You can separate it with by parting your fingers and separate it into splits. You can create lift and direction with your hands by carefully pulling and directing it. But in no time are they seeing back brushing or back combing. They're, not, they're just seeing the weight of that front section of the hair and then spray it in place. If the client has bangs, you can pull their bangs forward and do tendrils and do little pieces around their face if that makes it easier um, for you and easier for them to wear and to do. If their hair is longer, you can pull their hair all the way back from their hairline and still create um, that base. But it's about the strong back brush base because that gives me something to pin to. And it's about pleating and folding the hair under so that it creates a finished loop, a finished line that I'm attaching the sides to. So it's a a finished line that cups under rather than hair that is um, kind of gathered and fluffed and I'm seeing bobby pins. The difference between us doing their hair and them doing their hair at home is when we do their hair, they don't see the bobby pins. So, um, you know, it's a, it's the ability of, of really stepping up and, and doing a different complete kind of design. Now, the next one is called a four section chignon. And this does this, they, and these are all using the same set that we just, we did previously. So the first thing that we do with the chignon is, is you take, let's look at the section. Section one is from the ears down to the nape. Section two is a radial section that goes up from the ears up to the, to the um, apex of the hair. Section three is wide at the front and gets narrower as it goes back to the apex. And then section four is the entire crown. So let's start in section one. In section one, you pull section one all together back into a ponytail. And then you lightly back brush the ends and pin the ends up into the base of the ponytail. Now the ponytail is your best friend, especially if you're working with long hair, especially if you're working with healthy hair, because it gives you an anchor to connect things to. Now there's going to be more ends later. So um, if, you, if you can take section one and you do it relatively um, close to the nape, there's gonna be more hair coming in to participate and you'll see it. You'll actually see a model photo of this, this one in just a second. Section two, this is the center back is divided into three vertical sections. Vertical means up and down. Um, and each of those is subsectioned into, a, into an S pattern. So you take that section with a little bit of back brushing and you curve it into an S pattern and then pin it into the base ponytail. Now the S pattern will go towards the face, away from the face, and then connect with the ponytail. And then the center section will just be an S that flows into the center and it's pinned back into that base ponytail. On section three, you take a couple of soft horizontal sections and drape them across section two and then pin over and then behind the ear and pin them in. So you softly drape them, drape them over the behind the ear and over the previous section and pin it. And then section four, you push it into a finger wave softly and then bring it back and pin it behind the ear into the same section. Now, if you can read these instructions and visualize those steps, when I go to the next slide, you can, you'll see the finished result. This is the four sex and chignon after it's completed. Now let's deconstruct just a little bit. If you look right behind her earring on the left photo, go straight to the left, see that chignon that is there? That's the base that came from the hair at the nape. Then you see the crisscross pieces that are coming from the side sections creating a strong vertical line right behind her ear. And then if you look at the picture from the front, you can see that the front's been elevated before it came back and was pinned in. And interestingly enough, remember what we said previously about emphasis. In this style, the emphasis is at the nape, but it's at off center, it's at one side. I don't have a photo of the other side, but I've seen this style. So it is, it's off to one side, it's on the model's right hand side. So everything sweeps to that direction just a little bit. 
The last updo that we're going to talk about is called the low infinity. And the low infinity is really, really easy, and it's really made very, very modern because we're letting the ends hang out. Remember, again, the ends are straighter than the rest of the hair. So we begin by smoothing and gathering all of the hair and combing it back into the nape and then twist the entire ponytail clockwise. Turn the hair all the way around so that the ends come up on the right-hand side. Once the ends come out on the right-hand side, then you'll pin everything in place and you'll have the ends coming out kind of like a feather or a fan and you can flat iron those ends. If the hair is much long, is if the hair is too long, you can flip around two times before you start to pin everything in. This is a great look that is um, easily dressed with jewelry um, to um, add pizzazz or you can put a big clip or a big pin in it that can help you to hold things in place, but it also will give you a little bit of drama and a little bit of excitement. Um, just visually for your eye, the jewelry goes on the side that does not have the flat iron ends because we're balancing. Or if you want to create more drama, more drama, put the jewelry right in there where the flat iron ends come out and have the ends expand from or grow from the uh, the jewelry piece that you selected. So now just a couple of working and styling tips when you're working with long hair and when you're styling. And if, as you work in the salon, our recommendation would be identify two or three updo styles, such as we did here, get mannequins and practice with your staff how to do them and what to do and what the variations are. So that every single time, I usually when I go to a salon, I discover there's one person who does updos and everybody else kind of you know, suffers along. Or there's two people and then you have to go find that person and say, now what do I do? Well, if you do a workshop, get mannequins out, do a workshop on various lengths of hair, on various textures of hair, and get a couple versions of, here's two or three versions of a four sex in chignon. Here's a couple of versions of do it up, where we, we're working with the sides and the bangs and we're letting the back be long. Here's a couple of versions of, um, of, the, uh, of the last one. I can't remember what it's called. I have to go back. Of the, woo. A couple versions of the low infinity. So you can go back and you can say, okay, this is these are the options we have available. What is it you're looking for? And then you can start adding your own signature and your own ideas to it and grow from there. But please, as you start growing this portion of your business, start making sure you work with a plan and you work with direction. So here's some working and styling tips that can help you. The first thing is um, you can save your bacon with hair brands or hair ties or rubber bands. Um, gather and hold heavy hair together with a hair band. Now, there's nothing in the rules that says you have to use every single bit of hair on their head. If they've got tons and tons of hair, you can gather half of the hair below the occipital together in a ponytail, wrap it into a small bun, and then style the rest of their hair to cover it up. You don't have to use all of their hair. Another, another trick that I learned decades ago is to take a rubber band, a hair elastic, and put two bobby pins on it. So I've got a bobby pin, I'm holding onto one bobby pin that's looped through the elastic, and then I've got two bands of elastic and another bobby pin on the other end. You can make money if you sold these. Now, this is an easy, easy way to put a bobby pin in long hair, or an elastic in long hair. So I start by creating the ponytail, push the, hair, the bobby pin into the hair, wrap the second bobby pin around, and then push the second bobby pin into the hair. So rather than threading the hair through the loop of the bobby pin, you just use it. The, you use the bobby pins on the elastic to hold the to hold the hair pin or the, the hair hold the hair band around. Now the next trick, and I and I will tell you at Bricotta we call them Sammy pins. Sam told us years ago if Bobby can have pins, why can't Sam have pins? So we push Sammy pins into the hair. One of the most important things that you can learn is to quit springing open bobby pins. Everybody's sticking pins in their mouth and popping the spring open. Well, if you pop the pin open and then stick it into the hair. What happens is the hairpin gets too much hair, and so it will push itself out and work its way out of the hair. Instead, just pick the, pick the Sammy pin up off your station and slide it into the hair. Now, if you look at a bobby pin, there's one straight prong and one that's a little bit angled that's just a little bit shorter, and that's designed to scoop hair into your pin. And so push that hair in without spraying them open, and they won't come out. Another bobby pin trick is to pin crisscross the bobby pins over the top of each other. If you're trying to hold hair up at the nape of the neck, push the bobby pin up into the hair and then push a second bobby pin up over the tip of the first bobby pin and then crisscross them up and then take the last bobby pin and go down over the top of the other one. 
they're all holding themselves in the hair and you don't have to work really hard to get them to stay. The other thing to make pins stay in the hair is to remember you have to pin to a foundation. Um, backcombing creates a foundation. That's what was being created in the first technique we, we taught you is we created a foundation with that backcombing so we have something to pin the hair to. A ponytail can create a foundation. Hair that you've already previously anchored very strongly can create a foundation for you to pin things to. Um, spray as you go. Movable hold is the very best working hairspray I've ever worked with because it doesn't ever get to a point where you've used too much. Free fix is also a great working hairspray. So if you need to hold the hair in place or get rid of static or cling, just do a quick mist of movable hold or free fix to hold it in place. Smooth it with your hand or with the back of a comb and then move to the next thing. Another thing that can happen to you is make sure that you divide and conquer, especially when somebody comes to you with hair down to the middle of their back and they have a lot of hair and they want to have their hair done up for a special occasion or just because of the summer heat. You don't, don't even begin by grabbing all of their hair. Begin by sectioning their hair off into four sections if you're doing the Chanon type style, into three sections. Get Separate the front from the back and then work on the part of the hair that you're working on right now. And don't, remember, don't forget, you could eliminate some of their hair without cutting it off. Sam did a whole series of, of looks a few years ago where he gave long-haired girls short hair styles just by pinning up the, the hair below the occipital and then styling the rest of the hair. So the idea is um, you don't have to use all their hair. You just need to control all their hair. The last thing is look at the design from all different angles. Apply the principles of the design before your final spray. Walk around the chair. Have them stand up. Um, if it's for a formal occasion, ask them to bring their bridesmaid's gown or their wedding gown or the dress they're wearing to prom. Ask them to bring their jewelry so you know that you're enhancing what they had in mind and you're developing the direction. For a more casual up style, like, a, you know, like the ones we showed you today, they could be very, very casual and very, very quick. For a more casual up style, um, make sure the guest shares with you where they're going and what they're going to do and how long they want the hair to stay in this style. If it's just for the rest of the day, then you don't have to work as hard to anchor it and make it uh, make it have a foundation than if they expect it to last for two or three days and they're going to sleep on it. And so if they're going to sleep on that style, then you want to make sure they've got a stronger base to it and that it's held together um, with, with a more strong set of set of products. So I hope you've enjoyed those ideas and that input on creating a long hair style and creating updos. Some additional promos we have available this month include our color promotion. Now our color promotion is all about refreshing hair color. We have a webinar in the uh, on the YouTube channel at Bricado Salon that talks all about how to use um, color refresher. If you go to any of the color webinars, about two thirds of the way through, there's a whole segment on color refreshers. Color refreshers are created by mixing four ounces of constructor with one ounce of demi color in a color refresher bottle, sending it home with the guest. During May and June, you can receive color refresher bottles at no charge. All you have to do is buy 12 bottles of demi color and you can receive 12 color refresher bottles for free. It'll save you $21 on buying the bottles. Or another option is you can receive Constructor at no charge. When you purchase eight Demi bottles of color, you get a liter of Constructor for free. So by purchasing 20 bottles of Demi color, you've all of a sudden created a color refreshing business in your salon at no additional charge. Color refreshers are so important in the summer because we're outside, we're in the sun, everyone's active. They're usually shampooing their hair more often. And in those opportunities, we want them to take advantage of that opportunity to use such a great product to help them maintain their color. Lastly, a word from Sam. Um, I really believe that this is vital for you and it's vital for your success in the salon. No matter what you design, make it beautiful. Make it wow. Let, you, let it take your breath away. That's what good hair design and amazing liquid tools are all about. Transform the ordinary into something better, maybe even something extraordinary. One of the things I've always, I've always believed is when someone comes to your salon and sits in your chair, they have the opportunity to be beautiful and styling their hair in a creative way with an up style or a different type of technique than they would normally use is something that helps them feel pretty and helps them feel beautiful. Um, we have the opportunity and we have the, the blessing of being able to help people make that transition and help them grow and expand their awareness of art and fashion and design. And we're the ones that help that happen for them. Want to remind you that we have the New York Cut, Color, and Create Academy taking place um, four more times this year. The next Academy dates are June 23rd and 24th, then in August, then in October, um, twice in October. Your cost for the Academy is 
$475. And uh, there's information here on how to contact us. All you need to do is get a hold of Bricado. Our phone number is on the back of every bottle of product you have and ask for Kristen in the office and she'll be able to get you more details and get you registered for the Academy. Our new Academy format now includes um, hair cutting and hair color techniques. You'll do two haircuts and two color techniques. So you'll be totally up to speed and be able to be introduced to our view of multiplane color in addition to multiplane hair cutting. And then we wanna remind you to please join us on Monday, May 20th at 1 p.m. for our next webinar. Our next webinar is going to be focused on Bricado Super Silk. And uh, when you register for that webinar, we're gonna ask you some questions about using Super Silk and what you've done with the invitation. I'm also going to send out my email because I'd like to hear specific questions that you'd like answered so that you can, we can help you be more successful with Super Silk. It's a phenomenal service and a great opportunity to grow business in your salon. It's done phenomenally well, but I know there's also other opportunities with Super Silk that we're not taking advantage of. And we need to really step in and help the guests who can benefit from this great, this great opportunity. I want to remind you that we have a ton of online BBN resources, two YouTube channels, Bricado Super Silk and Bricado Salon, two Facebook pages, Bricado on Facebook and Bricado Super Silk on Facebook. Our web, um, our web page is BricadoToday.com. And on our web page are all kinds of tools that you can download if you're registered. You'll be able to download all kinds of business tools and marketing tools and signs and posters and things to help you grow your business. In addition, um, on our YouTube channel, the Bricado Salon YouTube channel is where this webinar will exist. So once our session is done today in about 24 hours, the webinar recording will appear on the Bricado Super Sil or the Bricado Salon uh, YouTube channel. So that's where you'll go to view it. As someone who's registered for the webinar, I'll also be sending you a link so that you can uh, link to the webinar and you'll be able to watch it at your leisure. It's a great resource. And on that site, you'll discover there are a lot of different webinars that you could also view. Webinars on hair color, webinars on salon promotions, webinars on product knowledge, webinars on color techniques. Um, we're continually adding. Every time we do a webinar, we put it in there so that you have access to it on a continuing basis. It's a great place to go for new salon, new hire training. If you have new stylists coming into the salon, people who aren't as familiar with Bricado, the great, one of the great places to start them out is on uh, Bricado Salon YouTube channel and have them check out some of those webinar videos. So I want to thank you today for your time and thank you for being here with us. It's been fantastic to have you and uh, encourage you to stay in touch with us and, and let us know how we can help you and what we can do to assist you in growing your business. Thank you.